morning I'm going to be in the 26th Psalm. Uh, Psalms 26, verse 1 says, Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart, for thy love and kindness is before thy, mine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. That's some good scripture right there. Uh, got some tough questions to ask this morning. How do you live your life? How is your Christian walk? Would you feel comfortable asking God to examine and prove your life, to judge you? You know, as Christians, we should be able to go to God at any time and ask him to examine our life, to ask him to prove our life, ask God to try us. You know, if we're living our life the way we ought to as Christians, that shouldn't be a hard thing for us to do. We should be able to, hey, God, just try me today. Examine my life. Check up on me. Am I where I need to be? But, you know, and we need to do that. As Christians, we need to go to God and check up every now and then. Just ask God, God, am I where I need to be? Am I doing what I should do? You know, we should make sure that we're where we need to be with God, that we're doing what God would have us to do. You know, and if you don't feel comfortable asking God to judge you, to examine your life, to examine where you're at, then you already know that something in your life isn't right. You already know that something is there that shouldn't be. Other it's whatever, you're doing something that you shouldn't be, or whatever, but you, you know if you can't ask God to examine you, you probably already know what it is in your life that shouldn't be there. You know, and if you know what it is, if you know that you don't want to ask God to check up on you because that's in your life, you already know but without asking God that you need to get that out of your life. You know that that needs to go, that that's something that you need to take care of. Or you know that there's something God's wanting you to do, that God's calling you to do, something he's telling you you should be doing that you're not doing. It may not be that you're doing something you shouldn't. It may be that you're not doing something you should be. You're not doing something that God's wanting you to do, that he's called you to do. It's not always something bad in your life. Sometimes it's just the obedience ain't there to do what God would have you to be doing. I mean, we all struggle with it. I mean, we I'd, every person in here, I would be willing to bet, has not done something at some point in their life that God's asked them to do. We've turned a blind eye, a deaf ear to it, be too inconvenient, take too much time, just make us get out of our comfort zone. Good word. But, you know, but if God's asking us to do it, if God's telling you that's something you need to do, then we really need to open our eyes and be obedient to God and do it. 
You know, we're called to be Christ-like. We're to show love and compassion and kindness. We're not to spread hate and discord. You know, we should walk with integrity in the Lord. And it's hard to walk with integrity in the Lord if you're doing something you shouldn't be or if you're not being obedient to God and doing what he's calling you or asking you to do. I mean, one's just as bad as the other, doing something you shouldn't be or not doing something that you're supposed to be. You know, as Christians, we were to be able to walk with our head held high as a Christian. We should be proud of who our Lord and Savior is. We should be proud to be a Christian. Amen. We should want people to see God in us and on us. We shouldn't have to walk around with our head hung in shame, afraid that someone may see what we're doing or where we're at or who we're with. You know, we should be Christ-like. There's, we should never put ourselves in that position to where we would be ashamed that someone would see us and what we're doing or where we're at. I mean, we should never, as a Christian, put ourselves in that situation. We should trust God. We should love God. We should live for God. And we should thank God. If we could do these four things every day in our life, keep those four things in our life, we should never have a hard time asking God to examine us, to check up on us, to judge us, to prove us. Those four simple things would keep us on the right path would keep us where we need to be with God. We all, all, every one of us need to check up from time to time with God and just make sure we're where we need to be, that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, that we're doing what God would have for us to be doing, and that we're living right for God. You know, when we fail to check up with God and make sure that we're where we need to be with Him, that's when we start to backslide. Mm -hmm. That's when we start to grow apart from God. That's when we let the devil start creeping into our life. And we can't do that. We can't be afraid to ask God to check up on us once in a while, to judge us, to prove us, you know, we all need to check up from time to time and just let God open our eyes and show us where we truly stand with Him. I wonder if anyone might have a word for the Lord this morning. anything we'll dismiss to our classes this morning
Praise everybody. Dalton, you pray for us this morning. I want, to, I want to read what James read again. This goes right along with our lesson this morning. It says, Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord. Therefore, I shall not slide. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. For thy loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. Now, there's two words right there that we're going to talk about today. The first one's in verse number one, and it's trusted. Now let me tell you something about trust. Trust is something that takes years to build up, but can be tore down in seconds. And the second one is true. Somebody give me the definition of truth. True. <laughs> That's okay. like it is. Transparency. That's right. Huh? Okay, it's it's a fact that's told that way, right? Okay. I work with a lady that is an atheist, and for for a while I worked with a, a man that was a preacher. And after he left, she all, all of a sudden popped up with these remarks she would make. I'd love to do, get in a debate with him about the things of God. And I thought, at first I thought, yeah, he'd tear you up in a debate. But after I thought about it for a while, he wouldn't. And right here's why. Because she only wants to believe fact. And what we walk in is a walk of faith. And that's two entirely different things. So, yeah, we have to realize that there is such a thing as the truth. The truth is what we believe, right? I believe that this word is the truth. I believe that every single word in it is the truth. Amen. But we walk in a walk of faith. Right. It's the truth and it's faith. Yes, now that woman only wants to believe fact, nothing else. Now I can't show her a picture of Jesus because there's not one that exists that I know of. That would be a fact. I could say this is Jesus, this is him, but I can't say that I know it. She would not believe that I know it. But if I was to show her a picture, she would believe that he existed. That would be the only way. All right. So we got two things here. We talked about trust and we talked about the truth. Now, let me ask you this. Raise your hand if you've ever been lied to. Of course, we all have. Now, I started to ask you if you've ever told a lie, but I figured it might get trouble. Started in the church. Because the first thing somebody would do is say, I knew it. <laughs> if we're not careful, we'll look for lies that each other tells, won't we? Because we all have, if we're honest, we've all told a lie. We've all been lied to. And when trust takes years to build up, one lie is all it takes to tear it down. I've been lied to, and I didn't know it. I've been lied to, and I found out later. I've been lied to. And then had half-truths told to me to cover up the lie. And whole lies again to scotch it with. I've had people look me in the eye and lie to me with me knowing that they knew that I, that I knew that they were lying. I know people that will look you in the face and tell you a lie when the truth will do better than the lie will. I've got a cousin that can look you in the face and tell you a lie and you know she's lying but she can tell it so conventionally that you'll still believe it. She's 
She's good at it. She's very good at it. Now, this one hurts. Raise your hand if you've ever been lied to and wanted to believe the lie. Now, that one hurts. That hurts on a whole other level. Somebody tell me why. You trust that person. And most of the time, you love that person. You have invested love into that person. Now, if your child lies to you, it breaks your heart. And when Caitlin was little, we have to teach our children not to lie, right? And she told me a fib about something, and I explained to her. I said, when you tell me a lie, that makes me not ever be able to trust you again until you rebuild the trust that I see you're not going to lie to me anymore. She was just a little thing. And she said, so you can never believe what I tell you ever again? And I said, after time passes by, you tell me the truth, tell me the truth, tell me the truth. It builds the trust back up between me and you, and I will start trusting what you're telling me is the truth again. But as long as you're lying to me and keep telling me lies, I can't believe what you say. And she got it. She, she's an honest person. She don't lie. Or, That's right, and especially concerning our, our children and stuff. It, th they're going to make mistakes, and we have to make them learn that trust is hard to build up and easy to tear down. Okay, when you want to believe the lie, it's because you trust the person, you love the person that, that's telling the lie. But here's the trouble with that. When it comes time for them and you to face the truth, it's a heartbreaker. Because you have to face the truth with them. You wanted to believe that lie. You wanted to believe what they were telling you, even if you knew that can't be right. You want to give them the benef every benefit of the doubt to, that maybe it'll work out, but it don't. What really hurts is when somebody tells you a lie that sounds better than the truth, even though you know it's not. That's exactly right. And then all of a sudden, it comes time for you and this person to face the truth. And you know what it is? It's a betrayal. This person has betrayed you. You put all this confidence in this person. You want to believe them. And, and when the truth comes out, you feel like you've been betrayed. And it's a heartbreaker. It really is. I believe that when trust is tore down in certain ways, that it can never be rebuilt back like it was before. There are certain things that somebody can do to you or say to you, or whatever, and it will destroy the trust that you have with that person until it can never be rebuilt again. Sometimes, lies go on for years, and the liar will live their lives with the lie, and the victim lives in ignorance. <coughs> but normally, even after years sometimes, the lie comes out, the truth comes out, don't it? Yeah. It becomes exposed for exactly what it is. Somebody tell me, where does all this come from? Where do all these lies and all this deceit and all these, you know, you can tell a lie without actually telling a lie. You can just simply let somebody believe something that's untrue, and that's just as dishonest. That's right. We, we want to tell, uh, normally, if we have a good relationship with this person, we want them to know the truth even if we're living the lie, right? Okay. To relieve our conscience, we want to go to this person and say, I'm sorry I lied to you, but we know. The lie's there. The trust is going to be destroyed, right? All this happens. It happens in our relationships. It happens probably more regular than we know. But where does it all come from? All the deceit. That's right. Okay, turn over to, uh, to John, chapter 8. That's where I want to get started this morning.
Okay. First of all, look at verse 13. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself. Thy record is not true. Now this is the Pharisees talking to Jesus. And then the first part of the next verse, and Jesus answered and said to them. Okay, then they had this big long conversation back and forth. And where we want to be is at verse 44. It says, Ye are the father, ye are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh his own, for he is a liar and he is the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Now, look closely at that. Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. Okay. He's talking about lying. He says that the devil is the father of lies. If you read on down here. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. That means he had nothing to do with the truth. Because there is no truth in him, when he speaketh, he speaketh a lie. He speaketh his own. That means that he speaks his own language, and his language is lies. Anything that the devil tells you is a lie. Any word that comes into your mind that you know is contrary to the word of God is a lie. You cannot make it the truth. He speaks his own language. His own language is lies. Now, it might have just a sliver of truth wrapped around it, but it's still a lie. Now, let's read it again. You are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer. Now, that's, that's a big word when you're comparing it to a lie. From the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh his own language. That's what that means. For he is a liar and the father of it all. So every lie that your child tells you, every lie that your closest friend tells you, every lie that your spouse tells you, every lie that you tell is from the devil and nowhere else. Good word. So don't forget that. So if we believe the word of God, and I believe it, Jesus told the Pharisees that the devil was a murderer from day one. Now somebody give me the definition of a murderer. While you're thinking about it, let me read it to you. He was a murderer from the beginning. What is murder? I looked it up. A murderer is someone who kills. That's pretty simple, ain't it? So from the beginning, the devil was someone who kills. And then it goes on to say that he abode not in the truth because there's no truth in him. So he was, he has nothing to do with the truth. Nothing. He cannot tell the truth. He does not have the ability to tell the truth. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh his own language because he is a liar and the father of it. That means that he is the father of all lies. He was a murderer from the beginning. He was a liar from the beginning. And he's the father of it all. It all comes from Satan. The Garden of Eden, just like you said. Mm. Now we've defined a murderer. Let's define a lie. Somebody tell me, what is an, what, what's a lie? Untruth. An untruth. I've looked it up. It's an assertion of something known or believed to be untrue with intent to deceive. In other words, you know it's true, you believe it to be true, but I'm going to tell you something other than what I know to be true in, in order to deceive you. I heard my dad say to a car salesman one time, do you know how to tell when a car salesman's lying to you? And he said, I've heard them all. And dad said, when his mouth's moving, he's lying to you. <laughs> and, and he was a car salesman. So that's what the devil is. When his mouth is moving, he's lying to you. All right. 
So we see in this one verse, the father of all untruth. He, everything that's untrue comes from the devil. He has one goal, and that is murder. And his means to carry it out with is a lie. He wants to murder. He wants to be involved in your family, not for good things. He wants y'all child. He wants Clementine. He is a murderer. I don't want him in my house, do you? He wants your child. He wants my child. He wants everybody in here's child, and he is a murderer. And his means is a lie. He will use whatever deceit he can to get into that family, to cause division in that family, and to murder not only your child. Listen to the list. He wants to murder your testimony. He wants to murder your children. He wants to murder your family. He wants to murder your joy. He wants to murder your peace. He wants to murder your happiness. He wants to murder your chance to have a good, holy life. He wants to destroy it. He wants to murder you personally. He hates you. Be not deceived. He wants nothing good for you. He is a liar. He is a murderer. And he will use the lie to murder anything that he can get into in your life. He's going to use whatever means he can to do it. Now, I'm not standing up here and, and saying people in here tell lies to, to cause trouble between one another in here. I'm saying the devil will become in, involved in your life if he's allowed to, and he will destroy it. And I'm going to give you an example of it here in just a second. I want to warn you. I want you to be on guard. The devil is out to get you. He's going to use lies and deceit and he will get you if you let him you've got to be on guard for this turn back to Genesis chapter number 3 Genesis chapter 3, starting at verse number 1. This is going to be Eve and her conversation with the serpent. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, we, we look at this, and we kind of want to give Eve a bad rap here she's having a conversation with the serpent and he's telling her all these things that will make her life better if she'll just listen to him um, she, we know that she takes the fruit and gives it to Adam and Adam eats and we say it's Eve's fault but it's really not Eve's fault because my question to you here is where's Adam how is this whole conversation taking place Eve and the serpent, and Adam nowhere around. Adam should be involved with Eve at this point. Right? So Adam, when she gave him the fruit, he understood exactly what he was taking. So don't be deceived. We want to say blame the woman, but it's really blame them both. The serpent, the first thing, notice, is the word subtle. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. Somebody tell me what that means. He's smooth talking. Huh? Smooth talking. Smooth talking. Cunning. That's, what, that's, a, that's on a subnote right here in my Bible. Good. I looked it up. <laughs> it's to use clever, indirect methods to achieve something. So... Look at how he words all this. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, 
Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now underline that. And listen to the way it's worded. Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Did God say that? He didn't say that. So he's, he's subtle. And to root out Satan's lies, you're going to have to look below the surface to understand it. What's that? Well, that's exactly right. So his lies are not obvious. The best lies sound the most like the truth. Right? Now, what's less obvious? A clock that's five hours off or a clock that's five minutes off? If it's five hours off, most of the time we can pick it out, right? But if it's five minutes off, we're going to be late for work or late for church, like I was this morning. But it wasn't because of the clock. <laughs> now, now, when me and Angie got married, I didn't know this happened. But I would walk through the house and be curious what time it was, and I'd look at the clock. And then I'd go to the, another room, and it wouldn't be long, and I'd glance at the clock again, and it would be maybe 10 minutes off. And I would think that clock it don't keep good time, and I would adjust it. And in a few days, it would be off again. And finally, I got to going through the house and looking, and every clock in the house was set to a different time. And I said, Angie, what's the deal with these clocks? They, they're all set at a different time. I keep that one set for when I go to work. And I keep that one set for when I go home. And I keep this one set for such and such. And every single clock was set for a different <laughs> project that she was working on. <laughs> so I've learned to keep my own clock with me and to go by it. <laughs> but that's not the end of the story. We went down to her mom's for, for Christmas one day. And uh, Angie's my brother-in-law. He said, I got to be in late for work. And the clock was off. And uh, he said, I got to looking at every clock and the whole house was wrong. <laughs> and I said, well, you might want to check with Kim because mine was doing the same thing and all the clocks were set to a, to a different time. And he said, that's what it was. I already checked into it. <laughs> well, my father-in-law was sitting there and he said, I know where they get it from. It's Mary Ann. She sets every clock in the house to a different time. <laughs> and we don't know what time it is ever. <laughs> so... All the clocks were telling lies. They were all telling close enough time to where you wanted to believe them. But you couldn't believe any of them. And that's exactly what Satan does. He'll set, he'll set something in your life just so it looks like it's just about right. But all that is is a trap that's going to make you late for work. He's smart. He knows what he's doing. So you got to look below the surface to find the lies. His lies are very close to the truth, and they're also very far from the truth. How is that possible? How can it be so close to the truth that you can't, you can't tell it hardly from the truth, and so far from the truth that, that it can't be right? Makes us more comfortable with the lie, don't it? Sometimes we're willing to be comfortable with a lie and we're not believing the lie that Satan gets in our mind and he convinces us that somebody else is in wrong or they are lying to the point where they will have little and start to believe hey, this person's against us. You know, as much as a Christian, in reality, God wants us, you know, all of the truth dwells in the body. You know, how do you explain that? That's exactly right. That is exactly right. Well, we'll look at how he words it right there. He says, Yea. 
hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Question mark. He didn't come out and say, God told you you couldn't eat all these trees. That would have been so obvious that he would have knew she, that he was trying to do something. All he done was ask the question, Yea, hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree in the garden? Question mark. Yeah. All he done was ask the question. She done the work. He planted a little seed of doubt in her mind. Now, now listen to this. Now, his lies are very close to the truth, and they're also very far from the truth. Now, think about the lie from Satan's point of view. He could make it his goal to trick you into doing something wrong one time, and he could do that pretty easily. But if he can tell you a lie or convince you of a lie that causes you to live your whole life wrong, then although it was harder for him to do, it achieved a much bigger goal. All he has to do is get you to believe the lie, and you'll live your life by it. Right? I mean, we all fall down sometimes and think, dang, why did I do that? And you get back up, and we say, Lord, forgive me for that, and don't do it no more. But if we're convinced of the lie, just like you said, we get comfortable with it, then all of a sudden, we're living our life with it. Sometimes it is. That's exactly right. They, they learned that from their mother. And, and you know, it, it probably works for them, but it didn't work for me. <laughs> I was late to work. Okay, so he can trick us into doing something wrong one time, or he can trick us into believing a lie that will make us live our whole lives wrong. So he makes his goal to convince us of a lie. And that way we'll live our whole life in the lie. And which benefits him the most? That's the question I want to ask you. Of course, that we'll live our whole life as a lie. It's more dangerous to believe the wrong thing than it is to do a wrong thing. Now, I, I've done things wrong that I've regretted. But when I live my entire life that way, it's, it puts me in, in much more of a dangerous place than just doing the wrong thing one time. So he's a clever liar. He's a master liar. He's the father of all lies. Now, he wants, of course, any liar wants you to believe their lies. Right? Right? But in order to do the most damage, commit the biggest murders in your life, he has to get you to believe the biggest lies. So if he's going to tell you a lie about the biggest thing in your life, what's it going to be? What's the biggest thing in your life? The biggest thing there is, period. God. He has to convince you that God is not who he says he is. God is the biggest thing in your life. So the biggest lies that Satan tells you are going to be about God. Now look at the question there that he asked her. Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree in the garden? Now he calls God by name. Hath God said this? He made Eve question God. Now, if we're honest and we look back and examine our lives enough, we're going to see that sometimes, sometime in our life, we've questioned God's motives. I know that I have. I've studied this out, and I've, I've looked back, and, and I can think of times when I thought, why, God? What are your motives in this? And that's all Satan has to do to get a foothold in. Now let's, let's look at the conversation between Eve and, and Satan. He's going to tell her, or he's going to let her believe, four lies. And don't be fooled, he still uses these four lies today. Now we're going to try to get through two of them. And if, if you've got something you want to add, just flag me down. Lie number one, 
God is not good. Look at verse number one again. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God hath made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So what's he trying to do? He's trying to successfully, he successfully does it, get Eve to think negatively about God. So to convince her that God is withholding goodness from her, that God is cruel, he asked her the question and then let the question do the work. Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now I've already asked you, is that what God really said? That one little question. And all of a sudden, she's, she's questioning God's goodness. Now, somebody tell me what God really said. You can eat of every tree in that garden except for that one. Look back at verse 16. Uh, chapter 2, verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree in the garden thou mayest eat freely, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat it, for in the day that thou eat it, Therefore, thou shalt surely die. Look at 16. Of every tree in the garden. That's what God himself told Adam and Eve. You can eat of any tree that you see here except for the one. Now, look back over here at the question Satan asked. Hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree? Now, look how sly that is. How He just put that right in there. That's exactly right. But see, the Lord walked with them both every day. And we don't know how much time passed between the time that God said you can eat of every tree of the garden and the time she had the conversation with the snake. So, I mean, God's not going to say, Adam, you just go on and tell her whatever you want to tell her. God didn't just leave them hanging. They walked together and, and had a close relationship every day. So the Lord said, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you can eat. But then Satan said, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree in the garden. Now, back to the original question that I asked. Where was Adam when all this was taking place? They should have been a team in all this. Okay, God said, Freely eat of every tree in the garden. So God wanted good things for Eve. He wanted happiness. He wanted joy. He wanted hope. He wanted freedom. He wanted fellowship for her with her husband. And he wanted fellowship with her and God himself. That was God's goal. All he wanted was fellowship with Adam and Eve. That's right. Well, he was subtle. He preyed on her. He waited till she was by herself. I mean, just like a, a predator that's a man that preys on women or preys, uh, a pedophile that preys on kids. They wait till they're alone, and then they go after their victim. That's right. He, he played it out to the right moment. Well, the word says the serpent was more subtle than any beast. Yeah. That means he had. He had watched. He was waiting. He was looking for his chance to do it. Now look what God wanted. He wanted happiness. He wanted joy. He wanted hope. He wanted her to have freedom. He wanted her to have fellowship with her husband and fellowship with God. Yeah. And with one question, Satan took all that away. He murdered all these things in his life. With That's exactly right. The, the whole problem started with the conversation itself. 
I mean, the lie couldn't have been told without the conversation. So she was entertaining the whole thing. There's no doubt there. She played on her thoughts and her conscience. Isn't that her thing? Did she start a thing? The thought of it? He planted the seed. He I simply pl planted the seed. The huh? <laughs> Say it again. I said that's the problem. She started thinking. That's right. So guess what this morning? God wants good things for you. He wants happiness. He wants joy. He wants hope. He wants freedom. He wants fellowship with, with you and your spouse. He wants fellowship with you and him. He only wants good things for you. Now listen to these verses. Psalm 84, 11. No good thing will I withhold from you if you walk uprightly. No good thing. He only wants good things for you. Psalm 34, or 37, 4, delight thyself in the Lord, and he will give thee the desires of thine heart. Now, that's a beautiful verse. Yes. But the thing that I've learned from that verse is when I delight myself in the Lord, he is the desire of my heart. Amen. He is the thing I want the most. Amen. And that's where Eve should have been. She should have been, have been delighting herself in the fact that God only wanted good things for me. Right? We can delight ourselves in that. And then God will become the desire of our heart. He only wants good for you. Lie number two that he told. The first one was God is not good. The second one, God is not truthful. Look at verses two through four. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat, neither Shall ye touch it, lest ye die? And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. That's a lie right there. The serpent said, Ye shall not surely die. Or, God lied to you. God is the one that told you a lie. He simply said, God's a liar. Now first, he got Eve to think negatively about God. And then he got her to think skeptically about God and about his word. All Satan had to do was simply put the question mark at the end of the ver uh, verse number one, and he could get her to question everything about God and everything about his word. Now, if you don't hear anything else that I say today, remember this one thing. Anyone causing skepticism concerning God's word is... Or, or that makes you doubt his word, his authority, his accuracy, his infallibility, his authenticity, or his goodness is doing the work of the devil. Good, Amen. Anybody. Now, I want to give you a good example. This will be, we'll end up today. It's not been that long ago that a, a preacher of a mega church was being interviewed on national TV, and the interviewer asked him, these are the words. Because we've had ministers on the show who said you either believe in Christ or you don't, that if you believe in Christ, you're going to heaven, and if you don't, no matter what you've done in your life, you don't. In other words, you have to believe in Christ to go to heaven. He was asking him if that's what he believed, and his response was, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> that is the best he could come up with. He said, yeah, I don't know. There's probably a, a balance between, I believe, you know, you have to know Christ, but I think that if you know Christ, you're going to have some good works. I mean, it's a cop-out to say you're a Christian but not have any good works. Now, did he answer the question? The interviewer said, what if you're Jewish? What if you're Muslim and you don't accept Christ? His response was, you know, I'm very careful about saying who would and who wouldn't go to heaven? I don't know. And the interviewer said, if you believe that they have to believe in Christ, they are wrong, aren't they? Talking about the Jews and the Muslims. And his response was, well, I don't know. I don't know if I believe that they are wrong. I spent a lot of time in India with my father, and I don't know... Uh, about all their religion, but I know that they love God, and they don't. They worship cows and stuff. I, I don't know. 
I've seen their sincerity on, on national TV. The best this fellow could come up with was, I don't know. In front of millions of people. Now, he's he doing the work of God there? Absolutely not. Sure. And, and just like that, go ahead. Just like that, in front of millions of viewers, a seed was planted that God's word was not and is not truthful when it says, Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He, he should have knew what that said. I don't know is not an acceptable answer. Now, we need some men that will stand up today and tell these young people, tell my daughter, Tell your daughter, tell your both your daughters, tell all of our children the truth. Amen. Jesus is the only way to heaven. Amen. Nothing else will do. Amen. We need truth tellers. Yeah. We need them in our church. We need them in our lives. And we have to look out for this, this trick of the devil. All he has to do is plant that seed. I don't know. Maybe there is another way. There's no other way. But now... They're not going to put somebody that's going to tell the truth on national TV. But it's up to us to root out these lies of the devil and make them come to life. Bring them out in the open and say that's a lie. It's up to me. It's up to you. And we have to do it. Shannon, you pray for us.